We ought to get started so we have ample time for a conversation about school reform, school politics. Um, I'm Jim Ferris, and I direct the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy. And one of the things we do at the center is try to stimulate and catalyze researchers within the university to focus on issues of philanthropy, nonprofits, civic engagement, and the like. And we do a annual, we have, we have a sort of a monthly research seminar series, and we decided this year that we would kick it off with one on school reform since we're all back to school about a month into classes here at USC. And um, we were really anxious to have Sarah Rakow from Michigan State come and talk about her research. She's published a book, which many of you might know about, called Follow the Money, How Foundation Dollars Change Public School Politics. And it's um, particularly appropriate because not only does it talk about the national scene, it also talks about a comparison between what's been going on in New York City and right here in our backyard, Los Angeles. And so as we scheduled um, the research seminar series, occasionally we'll have topics that seem to resonate with the philanthropic community. And so we decided we would convene people that were highly engaged, interested about education reform. And so that's the purpose of today's um, conversation. Um, Sarah, um, is a graduate of Harvard University and did her doctoral work at our friends up north, Cal <laughs> University of California at Berkeley. And now she's back in the Big 12, or actually Big 10. Big 10, the there's really 12 schools. <laughs> State in the political science department. And um, I didn't know it because I might not have invited her. She's a long-term long -term Duke fan. <laughs> so anyway, um, so welcome everyone, um, Sarah, um, to USC and LA. Thank you. And so let me just sort of explain how we're going to proceed this morning. Um, there are sort of two pieces to the research she's doing. One is focused on the national landscape and how that's taking shape with the influence of um, some large national foundations. And then she has another piece of her work which is focused on the comparison of New York and LA. And so she's gonna present the first in about 15 minutes or so, and we'll break and pause there for questions and answers on that topic. And then she's gonna move on and talk about the specifics of LA and New York City, the comparison and she'll do a short 15 minute talk about that and then we'll have ample time for questions about that and sort of issues around school reform in general, okay? So, Sarah? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm gonna jump right in here and start with our topic about what's, what's being talked about with philanthropy right now. You may notice that philanthropy, especially education philanthropy, is in the news quite a bit lately. Um, and the kinds of things that are being covered are not what you might have seen 10, 15 years ago. Oh, a big celebratory announcement about a new $15 million grant, something along those lines. A lot of the conversation is about political influence and policy influence. And it's hitting in sources like the New York Times and the Charlotte Observer mainstream news covering in this, in this vein. And so what I'm hoping to do today is, is get a little behind the news into what's happening and what's changing about philanthropy and its role in education politics. And as Jim mentioned, I have two different sets of stories that I'll tell. So I'll begin with this national level story of what's happening with new grant making strategies and how this might be shaping the influence that funders have. So if we go back um, to the early 2000s, kind of in the aftermath of the Annenberg Challenge, you're looking at a time when there was some soul searching among philanthropists, some questions about how to be more effective because that was such a large investment and many people were questioning whether the, the effects really um, lined up with the size of the, of the funding that was involved. And one argument was that funders needed to invest in higher leverage strategies in order to 
uh, gain, gain more bang for the buck, essentially. And what I pinpoint here, are, I think, are two key changes that you can really observe in um, the patterns of foundation grant making over the last decade. One is investing in the competition. So a big shift toward investing in organizations that essentially compete with or, are, or are, serve as alternatives to the traditional public sector in education. This includes charter schools, but it also includes um, alternative certification programs, say like Teach for America, alternative routes into teaching. But then secondly, there's the role of strategic philanthropy. So many major funders have um, have adopted this approach that we're going to drive ourselves toward data-driven results, we're going to track as closely as we can the investments we're making that and tying them to results and making sure to check back and see that those things actually fall into place. And what I'm arguing is that that is resulting in a certain amount of convergence, that funders are, are going toward the same grantees that fit a particular profile that works well within the strategic philanthropy framework. And the data that I'm using, um, I look at the 15 largest K-12 grant makers. So these are the 15 biggest funders in K-12 education in each of these three years, 2000, 2005, and 2010. It includes very familiar names, um, Gates, Broad, Walton, Carnegie, Ford, Annenberg, um, Kellogg, Dell, <laughs> um, they're, they're, they'd all be quite familiar. And the, the data is collected from the tax returns that foundations have to file annually. And this source provides every grant that they pay out, of course. And what I do is I collect every grant that I can identify in any way having to do with K-12 education across the board um, and code it as detailed as I can for, for you know, where the grantee is located, what they're doing, that sort of thing. So let's look at the data. Um, so this is a graph showing this pattern of investment in what I'm calling the more traditional institutions, the public sector primarily, with these um, newer organizations and primarily those that are, are competing with the public sector. So the blue is 2000, red is 2005, green is 2010. So you can see on the right hand side you have the public schools that includes school districts and individual public schools. A big drop in the share of funds from the largest funders that go to public schools. State departments of education, even more dramatic drop there. I include universities over here particularly because of their role they've traditionally played in teacher education. Um, and you also see a drop but not quite as, as severe as um, the other two. And then here we have charter schools, teacher training and recruitment, so that includes Teach for America and other alternative certification. Um, school leadership training and recruitment includes alternative pathways to being principal, uh, like new leaders for new schools. And then venture capital is a special new category that didn't exist in 2000, but it's new schools venture fund and other organizations like it that kind of collect funds and then reinvest them, particularly in charter schools. Um, Primarily, And you can see here, every one of those sectors grew, but particularly charters um, and venture capital. And I think it's worth pointing out sort of the mirror image you see in public schools and charters. Um, so basically, charters are now receiving the share of major foundation grants that public schools were receiving in 2000. So, Next, I want to talk a little about convergence. And first, I'm going to define for you what I mean. Can I yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, just the last slide. Yeah. Are you counting money twice? No. No, because I'm, I'm using the grant, the, the individual grant. So, when, uh, say, the Gates Foundation gives to LA Alliance, the CMO, then, then I have that. But then, if they separately give to New Schools Venture Fund, I have that. I don't have where New Schools Venture Fund then well, gives their money. New Schools then gives the alliance. Yeah, so, so I, that's, that's not in my, I just have the total that New Schools Venture Fund. Yeah, so, so that's what most of their money is going to charge. Right, so this is, so well, it's, it, it would be, if I could take this out, then probably this would be much bigger, is how I, so if, if New Schools Venture Fund was being, that's what, that's what I was yeah, yeah. So, 
so the convergence story is, is about grantees getting funds from more than one major foundation. So here what I'm looking at is out of the full data set of grants that I have, which includes thousands and thousands of grants, sometimes a grantee gets funds from more than one major funder. So take, say, Green Dot in Los Angeles. They maybe get a grant from the Broad Foundation and the Gates Foundation. So they're, getting, they're receiving funds from multiple major funders. And so what I did was I pulled out all those grants, all the grantees that got funds from more than one major funder and treated them as a group to see how large it was in each year of my data. So in 2000, 23% of the, the funds distributed by major funders that year went to grantees like, say, Green Dot that got more than one major foundation grant. That means the remainder, the vast majority, three quarters, went just in one, you know, one major foundation grant to a grantee. It grew a little by 2005 to 35%. It grew a lot by 2010, 64%. So essentially about two thirds of major foundation grants in 2010 went to grantees that received more than one major foundation grant. Um, so this is, this is the, the definition of convergence that I'm using. That major funders are converging, they're giving more grants to the same groups. And to give a little detail to this story, I've pulled out the top three from each year to show you who they were, how much they were getting, and how many major funders they had. So in 2000, um, the, the, the convergent grant making generally only included two or three major funders, um, no more than that. Um, you can see one of the Annenberg Challenge sites showing up here. So a lot of this is more of a public-private partnership model, um, and the dollar amounts are not huge. Um, and all the dollar amounts I'm showing you are adjusted for $2010, so they're directly comparable. In 2005, you see three or four or five major funders, so a little bit more clustering of grants. Um, you also see New Schools Venture Fund show up now, so less, you know, kind of more of a mix of uh, the public-private partnership and then the more um, investing in the competition sector. And the numbers of grant dollars grow a little bit. By 2010, it's really this complete shift. So Charter School Growth Fund, Teach for America, and KIPP are the top three in that year. Um, the grant dollars are much larger. Um, 40 million, um, and the number of funders are also much larger. And I think Teach for America is probably particularly worth pointing out here. So I only have 15 major funders in my data. 13 of them gave to Teach for America in 2010. So the outliers here are Kellogg and Ford, <laughs> um, happened to not give to Teach for America in 2010, um, but all the others did. Um, and then KIPP had nine major funders. So this is the kind of the top line story of the convergence, but I want to show you also a bigger picture because I think it kind of full, more fully fleshes out the story to see that it's not just these top grantees getting lots of money where this is happening, and it's a bigger phenomena. So I use social network analysis to do this. I'm going to kind of walk through the way this works. And what I did is I'm looking at the shared funding relationships between grantees. And part of what I think is interesting about this is it's not just that two grantees might share a major funder, but especially if they share several major funders, maybe if they share three or four or five, they probably are facing similar expectations for their reporting and evaluation, that sort of thing. And they may also have some networking opportunities. So there's something more going on, perhaps, than just these share funding relationships. It also shows the scope of convergence um, in education philanthropy. So I set higher parameters for convergence to, to create these diagrams. All of the grantees got at least $2 million in grants. And they all share at least three major funders with another grantee. So they would have to share, say, Gates, Broad, and Walton. Or they would have to share Hewlett, Annenberg, and Ford. They have to share at least three, if not more, with another grantee. So in 2005, this is what I get. Um, essentially, two separate clusters of grantees that are sharing major funders. 
Down here at the bottom, mostly nonprofits that um, partner with public school districts. So New Visions for Public Schools, um, based in New York City. Boston Plan for Excellence, based in Boston. Um, they both work with the public school district. The circles with the line, that indicates they share at least three major funders with each other. The larger circle for New Visions, that means they get more money. So, so the size of the circle is the size of the grants that they're getting. Up here at the top, a, a separate cluster that's more of a charter choice focused cluster. And what you can see here is some thicker lines. So New Schools Venture Fund shares even more than three major funders with KIPP. And the, grant, the funders are kind of separate groups, although not totally because Gates is in both. But Gates, Carnegie, and Annenberg are the main links between these, whereas Gates, Broad, and Walton are the, the three main ones here with others as well. So now I'm going to show you the network for 2010, and you're going to see something very different. Um, this is the exact same parameters, right? Same, same way that I created the network, but this is what it looks like. So now there's no separate clusters any, in any way, right? Everything's connected. Um, and you can see how many more thick lines there are, right? So a lot of groups sharing more than three major funders with one another. Additionally, that sort of cluster that was the kind of charter market-oriented cluster um, is now really at the center of the network. So you have the Charter School Growth Fund, Teach for America, New Schools Venture Fund, KIPP, at the center of this network. And I would say what's happened in part is where you had Gates, Broden, Walton kind of predominant before, you now have a lot of um, other funders following a similar strategy, say like the Robertson Foundation in New York City. So a lot of funders kind of taking up that same, same set of maybe agenda, picking similar grantees, and sort of overlapping with that strategy. And to the extent there's a somewhat different group, it's down here at the bottom where you have some universities. Um, and you see Hewlett down here, for example, um, and Ford are more represented among those grantees. But basically, there's, there's clearly a lot of overlap occurring in, in grant making. And so this is where I'd like to kind of wrap this up and, and hear from you about questions or comments you might have about this. But I think there's some interesting implications to explore that on the one hand, this, this is perhaps a very effective and influential strategy for philanthropists. That converging, having a, you know, a, a more particular agenda um, that is shared across a lot of big funders um, can lead to more influence. Right? You, get, you get more, that, that high leverage question that came after the Annenberg Challenge, it looks like that's what's happening. This is a lot of high leverage grant making and a lot of overlapping uh, strategies. But a narrowing of the agenda. Um, and so I think some questions might be, are there new groups or new innovations that are, are being left out um, in, this, in this environment? And also, particularly given the parameters of st strategic philanthropy that's very focused on measurement, that it might be the things that are hard to measure that um, don't fare as well in this environment. So I'll, I'll pause for a moment, and I'm just curious to hear if, of your thoughts or questions. Yeah. Sarah, I thought mm -hmm. that venture capitalists went into things that made money. Mm -hmm. Why are they investing in education? So it is, it's this idea of the venture philanthropy idea is, is essentially that you try to apply that framework of venture capital, but thinking of the return on investment not as a financial investment, but rather as a social investment. Wow. But you try to measure and track your results in the rigor, in a more rigorous kind of way, so that you're you're saying, okay, we invest these dollars, we get this social outcome for that. I'm curious because I'm looking at, for example, when Gates started that huge movement towards smaller classrooms, uh -huh. and literally over a period of a few years, they got the entire country onto the exact same platform, which ultimately was determined to have very few measurable results, or it was opposite in that it wasn't that positive. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is somewhat scary in that if you are having large collaboratives of extremely 
prolific funders all getting on the same bandwagon, where is the innovation then going to come from to challenge perhaps some of the, the programs they're implementing, there's something better, mm -hmm. or there's something more efficient, or something less expensive. Mm -hmm. Where is that going to come from when you've got everybody now getting on the same bus and no one is looking at other potential buses? Yeah, that's very much the question I'm, I'm both asking and hoping to look into further. I mean, I think there's some reasons to think that there, are, that there is the potential that other, both other funders see different strategies, particularly Ford, I think, is looking at itself as we're, you know, we're not Gates, we're doing things differently. Um, but there is, there is just a, a sheer size issue here, right? Gates is, is so large. Um, and I should point out in, in the data that I have that by 2010, those 15 largest funders account the, their, their grant dollars account for about 50% of the total that the foundation center estimates um, for private foundations in K-12 education. That's not obviously the whole scope you're gonna have. Um, you know, they don't count the really small funders. They don't always have all the corporate stuff, but still the, the piece of the pie, the, the top heavy distribution is, is kind of growing. Um, which, which would speak to this being a problem from so what you're saying. Sorry to ask this, I yeah. But how, how much, if they're giving 50% of the pie, how much do you see them as driving or controlling the policy implementation thereafter? Is it I mean, there's a, they, they have a lot, they do have a lot of sway. And I mean, I think it's also in the strategy that it's such a, a there's, a, there's a way in which, Gates probably operates the, this way in one of the strongest ways, right, where they, they kind of pick a, t pick a th right now it's teacher quality and really do set the agenda around that. That's part of their strategy is to set the agenda. Um, and it has been pretty effective. Um, so on the other hand, what's different about the way, at least just you know, zeroing in on Gates, but what's different about the way they seem to be doing teacher quality compared to small schools is there has been a, a big research component of that at the front end, and they didn't seem to do that so much with the small schools, right? They kind of just jumped right in. Um, so maybe the, you know, there, there's some learning going on there. But yeah, the, all these questions, the size factor, it's just hard to kind of get past how, um, how big a role that seems to play. Yeah? Is there anything that, uh, That's a great question, and I I don't you know I don't look a lot of what I look at is very urban focused because I'm looking at the largest funders. Um, what I can say also that that probably speaks to the geographic distribution is that there's some similar patterns of convergence and a place level, so places that get a lot of funding seem to get even more <laughs> as you go forward. Um, and so funders are, are also kind of converging in that way, which would probably from a, you know, for rural or smaller communities, put them less in the game for this kind of thing because they're not, you know, many of these are the largest school districts. Um, and I, I've looked a little at sort of the, fa and I'll talk about that more, so the factors associated with places that get the most money. Um, and yeah, the, the rural communities are not, there are funders obviously that make rural their focus, but um, they're not generally the big ones. Yeah. I had yeah. Would you, give, would you give me an example or us an example of this item, the third bullet, uh, the difficult to measure activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the two examples I have here, um, and when I started to think about this, one is 
um, maybe the more political or advocacy side of, of school reform, that that is notoriously difficult to measure. Um, you're probably not even necessarily going to try to directly tie that to student achievement outcomes. You might be looking for other outcomes related to the political process or change or you know, contacting a certain number of parents. And I mean, there is some work on this, especially for the funders that fund the charter organizations. There's a lot of work with mobilizing parents around charter schools. Um, but I think as a difficult to measure activity, there's the investment there definitely seems to be much less. Um, and, it, and it seems to be a poor fit with the strategic philanthropy model. Um, the other one I've, I'm kind of interested in is this wraparound services idea. So something like the Harlem Children's Zone where you're, you're doing the health and you're doing all these other pieces. And while Jeffrey Canada obviously is very effective at attracting funds, I think it is a question if that's something others are trying to replicate, how well they can do to attract funds um, for something like that, where what, you know, what is the effect of the asthma programs or these other pro and I mean, the Harlem Children's Zone has had trouble demonstrating the, you know, that in a very measurable way that's satisfactory to a model focused on student achievement as a, as a main outcome. Um, yeah. Do you see anything that's tied, any, or any funding matters that are trending more towards outcomes related to employability or employment or entrepreneurship or being able to generate an income or something like that? Uh, in terms of relate, like uh, tracking for an education program and whether, not, not a lot. And I, and, um, I think that's, that's a, just a research challenge that you have to track such a long term, you have to have, a huge longitudinal study and know what's happened to the students when they're 25 years old. And that I've, I've seen some terrific studies. I think MDRC did one on vocational education. But the, if you think about that in relation to the timeline of a lot of the funders, it's, it's not in the cards <laughs> um, to wait 10 years and see. Yeah. I have a question for related to what we were talking about earlier. Um, convergence in a lot of money My standpoint has been really effective dollars. You mm -hmm. look at the performance and the success of mm -hmm. the alternatives. And yeah. The lesser, you know, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. My question is more why isn't the education industry, <laughs> in, why is not K 12 changing as quickly as I think it should uh -huh. given the success of those areas? In other words, it's almost the opposite question if you were asking. Yeah. You were asking, you know, well, if that controlled me, if you really want all the money going there, uh -huh. I would say we not only want all the money going there, yeah. we want all the students going there. Mm -hmm. and if not going there, at least taking those lessons and applying them so that those lessons which are have been uh, generated, let's say, through philanthropy, iterate across non philanthropic situation. So mm -hmm. that would be my question. Why isn't that happening? And where is the pushback? And what do we do about it? Well, that's probably a little more what I'll talk about in the second part. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of, I mean, part of it is, is it is a sheer scale thing. So as much as I've been emphasizing the size of these major funders and, um, and then what is, gets added to the size when you when, they're com when resources are being combined, it's still tiny compared to the size of the public sector. Um, and charter schools are still only about 5% of the, of the share of schools. And so, I mean, I think that's yet another question to ask when you look at that shift in investment is it's that much more targeted. It can be, yes, I mean, that much more effective and those schools can, and can be doing very well in many cases, but then your 95% is still over here, right? So, well, I mean, I think you have to go, in part, go back to see all the times that philanthropy has, has tried to work with the public sector and it hasn't gone so well. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's a real political question, right? You're dealing with uh, interest groups and people who have 
vested interest in, in particular institutions or how things are done and changing those. Um, you can create parallel institutions and that's what's kind of been happening, but that it takes a while for that to then reflect back and change the public institution. And that, I guess I should probably save more of that for what I'll talk about later because I think some of that has been happening in LA, but as you say, it doesn't happen quickly. Um, and I don't, I don't know if there's a way it could. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the implications are, are you, are you asking those questions from an academic standpoint, uh -huh. or are you asking it from a practical standpoint? Uh -huh. because, you know, if you were on the board of a nonprofit, yeah. one of the things you would say is let's not have mission drift. Yeah. Let's really focus on what we think we do and we do well, and let's focus on doing that. And that sort of discipline that a lot of people have said you should do with your business or with your own nonprofit seems to have infiltrated major nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons you're having an emergence is exactly what they said. I mean, the amount of private philanthropy that's going into, let's say, public institutions, it's like a, a flea uh, or a nap, a mm -hmm. And so if you're going to have an effective impact to try and really make a difference, then it makes all the sense in the world to have convergence yeah. and to say this represents the best opportunity to affect change. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we all do that as opposed to trying to say, well, what else is there out there? Because there's always something else out there. Yeah. You know, and if you're trying to fund every innovative idea, then you're doing it at the risk of not adequately resourcing ideas that are having an impact. Mm -hmm. So 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 I, you know, I don't know if there's a question to, to be answered on the implications other than it looks like a lot of people finally figured out maybe the best way to impact public education is to share resources and grants and really focus mm -hmm. and not be as diffuse as they have been in your form. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that describe that, yeah, that absolutely describes what what's been happening i would just add that i think there's there is disagreement out there so i think it's it is effective and um it's but i don't think it's the whole story <laughs> um, so, so so i guess my thing is, is what's the other story mm -hmm. words, if you look at it it's effective uh -huh. and that the, in the in the philanthropy that's being done mm -hmm. the disaffected are always those who yeah. You know, it's uh -huh. a good idea too. Uh -huh. But in, in the absence of showing that the convergence is not leading to effective change, then why not say this is great? That's what I would say. Well, I, I guess to so pose it another way, I mean, I have this sort of open question about like what kinds of activities fall fall out of this model. But I think you could also, if a lot of this model prizes innovation, right? And prizes that the charter sector say will continue to innovate and be under pressure to compete and do better. But you also wonder then about if you can rewind to think about Wendy Kopp going around and seeking funds the first time when she was trying to start Teach for America, that if if this is so if this is as large as it looks then if you're Wendy Cop now, is any who's noticing you? I think is the way I'd pose the question. That there may there may be something lost. I guess another kind of is there may be also something lost on the innovation side here, um, especially when it's Kip. You know, it's it's a lot of the really usual suspects who and you know they're 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 doing well, but. I, I'm still questioning whether something is getting lost out of so much overlap that appears to be occurring uh, here. Moving on, uh, Mark, this yeah. is a question yeah. you're saying about the dual kind of parallel systems. Yeah. I, I'm interested in, in, maybe this is the second part, but you know, you talked about the, how the, the money shifting, the investments are shifting the education. I'm interested to see how the money and how money is spent in districts. Mm -hmm. should, you know, to get to how you right. change, you change how the money is spent right. in public systems. And with the increase in investments in say charter schools, are you seeing a different kind of 
valuation in districts yeah. is how they're sending the money, which either causes them to change or causes districts to remain the same. Right. That like is having investment comparison, yeah. I think, can get to some of the to some of the issues. I'm asking yeah. Ellie, we're seeing progress, uh -huh. but then some folks might say we're seeing some regress uh -huh. in the dollar for the dollar to home. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I like that idea a lot. And you know, I really, I have not looked at it, but yeah. Um, I, I really like the same, this issue you're talking about, and I could probably tease up your second half, uh -huh. because all, all of that investment of philanthropy is really only in the event it does impact the large mm -hmm. like There's, you know, and that's just obvious. So the question is, is it impacted? Mm -hmm. And so how? And the second thing I'd say, in relation to your, your third point here, I really still do see um, uh, innovation happening mm -hmm. outside okay. of this block. Yeah. And, and I'll use an example yeah. of, and I'm sure everybody read that in your times in yesterday, that example of, like, you know, in the blended learning area, that's, there's a lot of innovation happening. Uh -huh. There are a lot of ed tech people, you know, like coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that innovation is happening, and I actually think a lot of that innovation is happening within, let's say, the charters or new school uh, venture fund, you know, they're fueling innovation. So I think it's wrong to look at it as well. Those are you know, the same old, same old. They're really not. Mm -hmm. All of those alternatives are iterating even as we all sit around the room. Yeah, I, I see that. Although. I'll just uh, I'll keep kind of adding my little questions on the end that that I think there's there's there the mo there is still a particular model to thinking about how you're measuring outcomes and what outcomes matter that is again I'd say not totally widely shared and any it's it's just it's the trade off of this kind of thing right you you do have to pick outcomes right if you want to be disciplined if you want to kind of stick to your strategy. But when you do that, there are things you're not measuring or there are things you can't measure as well. And I do think that affects the strategies. Um, but I still, I definitely see the point that you're making. Yeah. So there's one thing, and I don't know if you're researching it, but you're asking this, because you're going to major funders. Yeah. And we were drawing an analogy to this is marketplace. Yeah. You know, a lot of startups, they're not on the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. Not funded by by even major venture capitalists. You know, oftentimes it would be you know somebody in a garage with Steve yeah. Jobs or Wozniak, mm -hmm. and they start off with an idea, and the idea cap, cap, catches on, and then it begins to get additional funding. So yeah. there was a time when Kip was not receiving major yeah. capital. Yeah. You know, there was a time, well, I can't say it about money, but for a lot of ideas, they did not. Come from the major funders. Yeah. They came from the local people. And, and, so, and so I'm not sure that there are ideas out there that are really novel, important stuff that have not found support. And I don't know that because of the way you went about doing your research, mm -hmm. that there's a way for you to find that and capture it. Because oftentimes, good nonprofits start off with small grants. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be 25000 mm -hmm. it can be a group of people getting together and saying this is a good idea, and they started. And as the idea begins to germinate and it resonates with others, it kind of works its way up to be seen by major funders in the same way that a startup company works its way up, where it's first identified by venture capitalists, put more money in it, mm -hmm. and then eventually it goes public and longer money in it. Mm -hmm. So I think that analogy works in the, in the social sector sphere. For yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I would, I would just r point out, though, again, that you, if you go back to 2000, you had just that 23% of major foundation grants overlapping, and then the remainder not. And so, uh, y y like, if you look outside the major funders, then I can, I can see. But I think there is. There is a lot of money getting tied up more so now on a common set of organizations that are not necessarily the next new thing, although they are new. They are new. <laughs> um, so 
I, I would still point to the pattern and also question, is this a pattern that's continuing? So if we saw 64% in 2010, what are we gonna see in 2015? Um, or have we kind of leveled off? Because I think if it continues, I would suggest the problem that it could really be something where there's, there's less capital out there to capture these, um, these ideas. Um, that was kind of my question. Yeah. You know, your data is 2010. Yeah. Did you have conversations that make you think that the convergence is accelerating? <laughs> my sense is that it is. Uh -huh. um, and also, as you look at that, the convergence accelerating here, um, have you had conversations with foundations about all right, if they're really going to focus and try to move broad public systems, are they willing to expand their efforts to both A, validate their work, and B, uh, engage the public mm -hmm. to be accountable for those shifts. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that basically there's less money for startups now because of this convergence from what through work I can see. Um, this is a bummer for startups. Yeah. Yeah. We make any money. Yeah. You know, in, in a lot of grants, little grants, uh, that we have, we have a good idea. Uh, there are people who want to support that idea if it's filling a need that we perceive exists. And, and I think, you, you know, I, I think that there's, a, that, you know, I have to think Maybe about it. Maybe <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, going back to Virgil's point, one of the challenges I see is that education, to a great degree, illustrates an enormous um, episode of market failure in that there's not, um, I, I think all of these um, charters and whatnot is our effort to create almost a false market in a system that hasn't really been working very well. And while the charters, I think, are very helpful, I think the challenge becomes a lot of the smaller foundations, what you're talking about is funding the innovators, is that they become singlers to areas that, that other funders then sort of gravitate to because they feel that it's been vetted in a way that, that the smaller foundations don't have the staff to vet. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to agree with you on the, on the challenge with, uh, to use a venture model, the challenge with that is that you have a much quicker ROI. I mean, you're not having multi-year yeah. waiting time to see whether or not an innovative strategy will work. Uh -huh. So the challenge becomes finding investors that are willing to put that money in without knowing whether it's a product that's going to be profitable or do well in the system. Right. And we're losing a lot of the big signaling funders that would fund those innovative strategies and encourage the smaller funders to say, okay, we'll give it a shot, because they're all funding sort of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what is um, just worrisome. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, I should get a good check on time. Okay, so I'll shift, but then we can have more, more time for conversation after this. So this is where um, I look more into the the political side and also this question that we've been talking a lot about, the relationship between philanthropy and the groups they're investing in and then the public sector and, and how that influence might play out. So this is drawn from my book and I mean one of the big questions I'm asking is about the sustainability of reform over time and I think this is particularly important when you're talking about philanthropy because funders often uh, don't plan to invest forever <laughs> in something, right? The idea is you start something, it gets taken up by the public sector, it takes on a life of its own, you can then move on to other types of innovation. So this is a pretty key question when, when you're talking about this, this type of strategy. And as I mentioned, one of the things I looked at is, is a geographic uh, distribution of funds. Where were these major funders giving the most money? And um, I, I did this with a statistical model to kind of predict which characteristics of school districts, see which characteristics of school districts predict where the most money goes. And by far the strongest association uh, was with mayoral or state control of the schools. So with the largest school districts, the ones that had mayoral or state control, so no elected school board, um, were getting the most money. New York City, Chicago, New Orleans, Oakland, and that actually makes Los Angeles stand out um, as, as somewhat distinct because there is a lot of philanthropic activity here. Um, 
and there is an elected school board. <laughs> um, and that's how I picked my cases. I thought it would be very interesting to investigate um, New York, a place with mayoral control, with Los Angeles, ones that not, one that's not. They're also, of course, the two largest school districts. And my research is based on surveys and interviews that I did in 08 and 09, with a little bit of follow-up before the book came out um, in 2012. And first to talk a little about some of the comparison, similarity, and differences between the two. Um, New York City has had mayoral control since uh, 2002, since Mayor Bloomberg uh, started the first of his, his three terms. And it's a very top-down form of mayoral control. He appoints the chancellor. Um, there's no elected board. And the mayor also appoints the majority of those board members um, and can remove them at will. Um, so there's that, that's sort of the advisory board that, that exists. Of course, in Los Angeles, there was an attempt at mayoral control um, with Villaraigosa, but that didn't happen. Um, and it's been continuously governed by the elected school board. In terms of foundation funding, I think there are some parallels, even though they look quite different, um, where basically there is a strategy of uh, of market-oriented policies involving some school choice and involving um, outside organizations playing a role in running schools, but they are quite different. So New York City's uh, Children's First agenda started with Bloomberg and then Joel Klein is basically a portfolio district model. So they uh, started closing low-performing schools and then uh, opening new schools at first primarily um, with the Gates small schools type strategy, but other funders supporting that as well, opening new small schools, um, nearly always with a nonprofit partner um, working along with the district. So these were public schools run by nonprofit partners. Um, but in recent years, it's shifted in a charter direction. So a lot of the new schools now being opened are charter schools, um, which is kind of making it look a little more like LA in some ways. In LA, it's basically all charter, <laughs> um, and especially charters operated by charter management organizations. And this is very much reflected in where the money has gone in each district. So this is from the very same set of data that I've been showing you, um, the 15 largest funders. And here I'm just pinpointing um, when grantees are, the ones who are located in New York and the ones who are located in LA based on different categories. So um, in New York City, you have really an alignment of the public sector and the philanthropic sector in terms of the strategy and then how the philanthropic investments were being made. So a decent amount of funding going actually directly to the school district in New York City um, for redesigning the school district bureaucracy. A pretty large chunk going to nonprofit service providers. This is the category that includes um, those organizations that partnered to create small schools. It also includes a new um, principal leadership training academy, a nonprofit. Um, and in many cases, what you'd see is you know, the funders would invest in an organization. That organization would then contract with the district. I mean, a lot of coordination here. And then you see the charters kind of pop up in 2010 in New York, going along with that, portfolio, that shift in the portfolio strategy. And again, a lot of public sector philanthropic coordination. They're opening up more of the charters in the portfolio model. The funders are investing in charters. And then this last category is advocacy organizations. These are the more political constituency-based organizations, which do get a little funding as well. In Los Angeles, it's, it's basically all charter. Um, it, it's where most of the major foundation funding is going, hardly any to the school district in the years that I cover. Um, and the advocacy category here includes organizations like Inner City Struggle and Community Coalition. Yes? It doesn't include the dollars that went into campaigns to put the right No, it does not include those dollars, although I'm very interested. <laughs> Because those are not um, those are not going to be reported on the 990s. <laughs> yep, um, those are private. Uh, I guess for well, they all declared. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Not there, so. it's declared, but it's declared in the campaign finance reporting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I actually used to work at New Schools Venture Fund a oh, okay. long time ago, and yeah. I'm seeing so many people who were either grantees at New Schools or were early staff members are now in the federal government. Uh -huh. Department of Education, and yeah. I, I see that there's one of the benefits of the convergence is that 
people are kind of plants in, the system, in broader public systems where they can push a button. So yeah. I, I think that there's there's one lens that we're looking at, okay, with our philanthropic dollars, mm -hmm. what we do in terms of giving to nonprofits, but then thinking about broader leverage of kind of investing. Yeah. I mean, kind of to Chris's point about even though it's different dollars, but we're, we're supporting this pipeline of leadership that can then bring in Billions of dollars. Yeah. Teach for America, exactly. Yeah, there, that's actually a really interesting, there's a lot There's a lot of that. If you look at the movement of people, and I, I mean, I've looked at it a lot in LA too. You see the movement from the charter sector into LA Unified and back and forth, and um, yeah. <laughs> it would be, that would be a great social network. To, <laughs> yeah, it's a map. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to kind of jump from this to talk through some of the political implications. And these are basically summarized and drawn from the interviews and surveys. Yeah. Can I just ask one question? Yeah. The huge drop on nonprofit service providers in New York City. Yes. Do you think that has any correlation to the sudden opening of many charter schools? Yes. OK, so they very just diverted the dollars from that to the charter schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where this was very much a small schools Pu small public school strategy. So this was a lot of the Gates small public schools. Some of those organizations continued to get that funding, and some of them shifted. So you had New Visions for Public Schools, which was huge here, opening the small public schools. They do charters now. So they basically innovated along with that strategy, and, and they do that now. Did that shift in strategy, though, between those years ultimately result in the sort of ending of a number of programs that did benefit the kids, you know what I'm saying? Where they made, it was like a shift in strategy and so let's just cut this off and start something new. So those schools still exist in New York. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's been an interesting part of the Gates small school story is they, they've kind of gone and said, well, it worked best in New York <laughs> from their evaluation. So they have, a, they have a very strong evaluation of New York that shows that. And, and the school district has carried it forward with their own money. Um, and then I think if you look elsewhere, you see more the story of school districts not being able to keep some of the small schools running um, after they lost the funding. But New York, it has kept up. Yeah. So looking at the, 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 pol the politics here a little more and the, the interaction between these, um, in New York City, this is where I'm, I'm arguing you can see the sprint. And, and I'm posing the question that perhaps we might, you know, Bloomberg's term is ending, we're reaching the end of the race. Where, where are we? <laughs> um, and in many respects, there was, there, was a, there was an entrenchment. They were really, Bloomberg was very effective at kind of sticking to this agenda. The funders kind of stuck along for a long way. Uh, mayoral control, you know, there were some real political uh, question marks along the way. They got mayoral control renewed in 2009. They've kept up the difficult aspects of the portfolio strategy, which includes closing a lot of schools despite lawsuits, uh, despite um, a lot of protests. Um, but what I would argue is that there's, this is sort of the difficult and maybe in the long run more questionable side of that philanthropic public sector alignment is that if you're inside that, it can look like everyone's with you, everyone's behind you, you know, we've got all this momentum moving forward, but if you just take a step back or look at it as a bigger picture, it doesn't look so stable at all. Um, so in terms of the investments, and again, this is drawing from, from my surveys, there's a lot of political capital invested from the school district. There's a lot of time and political capital invested from these nonprofits that have partnered with the district and see the district as their main collaborator. Once you get outside of that, there's not a lot of investment in these strategies. And that's, I mentioned the, the public school parents, but it's also kind of in the advocacy sector. Just, they were kind of never, as involved in the process of the decision making and never as invested in the strategies. And this really plays out in the interest group alignments that I observe. It's a very divided network. So the groups that had a role in, in implementing this, in developing these strategies, they're very closely aligned with one another. They have a great coalition. But it is not a very diverse coalition. It's a fairly narrow coalition. and 
it does not include um, large segments of the interest group community in New York City. And what I would argue is this is part of what's starting to play out now more in the political process in New York. And I mean, the most dramatic example is the mayoral primary that just happened. And while I wouldn't go so far as to say that education was the biggest issue in this primary, um, there were a lot of issues at play um, besides Anthony Weiner. <laughs> um, but you had Bill de Blasio uh, win the primary last, last week. Um, he was the candidate amongst the Democrats who was most opposed to Bloomberg on just about everything, um, and certainly on education. He wants to cap charter schools. He wants to stop charter school co-locations in public schools. Um, he wants to charge char charter schools rent for space. Um, he wants to stop closing schools. He's opposed to the way the portfolio strategy has been implemented. And most of the other Democratic candidates had some aspects of that as their agenda as well. There was very, Christine Quinn arguably the least so, but most of the candidates were not running on a platform to continue Bloomberg's education policies. And why this is important, I would say, is not so much as a campaign issue, but because of what can happen now. When you have New York's system of government, when the mayor has so much power, it's the implications of who becomes mayor. Whoever is mayor will have just as much power as Bloomberg did up to this point, and what is lacking is who is the constituency to keep this going? Who's the constituency to say to Bill de Blasio, no, don't reverse all these things? And I would argue it's not a large enough constituency or it's a constituency that's so tied and invested with Bloomberg, they're not well situated to kind of realign themselves with a very different governing coalition that we might see um, after November. So that's why I would argue the sprint is looking kind of fragile, as, as strong as it's been through Bloomberg's three terms. Here in Los Angeles, um, we're looking at a slower evolution <laughs> for, for many reasons, um, and that's why I call it the marathon. Um, and it's, it's a striking contrast to New York in many ways. Um, but I think what's perhaps most interesting about Los Angeles is that you have this more diverse alignment of interest groups who are not always a coalition and they're not always aligned with one another, but when they are united, they're generally working towards increasing school level autonomy. And I mean that in the broadest sense, not just charter schools, but public schools as well. Um, and we've seen that play out in a few things, particularly in public school choice. Um, but that this is a sec this coalition, <laughs> when it emerges, crosses the charter sector, the philanthropic sector, the advocacy organization sector, and the public sector because of people within LA Unified who also believe in this school level autonomy. It really just doesn't include the union <laughs> for the most part. Um, and the two key turning points in this have been public school choice, um, a time when the district in the broadest sense adopted a strategy where they were going to start allowing school level autonomy for a lot more schools and have this open bidding process for who's going to run the schools with the apparent retraction of the MOU between UTLA and LA Unified in 2011 where they cut charter schools out of the um, public school choice bidding process. But I think looking ahead you really see again, again the, the investment and the dynamic is still heavily on the charter school side for school level autonomy, right? 229 charter schools, this is, I think is last year's data. Um, but you, you have the pilot school model, and this is where I would say this, this issue of is the public school sector trying, are they emulating what the charters are doing? Is there learning? I would say yes, there is. And it's happening more organically, and it's happening in a way that's creating buy-in that New York never quite achieved. Because these are UTLA teachers now going through the new MOU process who want to create pilot schools. They're the ones who want to do it. Um, but, right, it's still very small, the numbers. And so the lessons I would suggest are that there's this question of can LA continue down this path? And I think there's a few strengths in what has happened in Los Angeles that suggest that it really could. 
and why it maybe is a more sustainable path than New York, even though the road is, is long. <laughs> um, first, there is the, the more inclusive and diverse network, which, as I mentioned, is not always united as a coalition, but when it is united as a coalition, is very powerful. And secondly, it's just not as dependent on leadership from the top. There's, there's a new mayor. I don't think that matters. I'm sure it ma I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But in comparison to New York, there's just, it's just a huge difference. But there's this question of time. Um, and I think I'll, I'll maybe wrap it up here now and, and listen to what you all think, since you're here in LA. And I'm sure you have a lot of, a lot of questions and thoughts on, on where LA is going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a couple of questions for you, but we'll start with um, your sort of initial one, which is maybe there are other outcomes that are not being examined aside from API scores, mm -hmm. CST, and how many kids are college ready, and, you know, which I will, obviously, I probably, probably shouldn't my hand, I think are really important factors. But I'm interested, you know, because you look at this from a policy, a much higher policy perspective, what are the outcomes that you're talking about that you feel are being lost? Uh -huh. And okay, what are they? Because I'm, I am interested. Because at the end of the day, I mean, this is really not a public private tug of war as mm -hmm. much as everybody around these issues want to do the best thing for kids. And that's, you know, that's really fundamental what everybody's about. And I, I imagine that's your. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think there was the question from over here earlier about the um, like the longer term outcomes and some of the I, I mentioned there was that MDRC study. There are these studies where if you look at things like employment outcomes or income in the longer run, you don't always see that relationship with an eighth grade test score. Not that there's, but but that. Something say like vocational education maybe has a payoff that's not strictly tied to a test score, but does have another payoff that you're not measuring. Employment. Employment. Not graduation. Perhaps not. I mean, I, I think that's one that's arguably important. Um, I would say college, though, is another one, and you can see it with KIPP. So KIPP has these terrific test scores, and they have terrific graduation rates, and they also appear to do quite well with getting students to college, they don't do as well with those kids completing college, right? And that's one of the things they're looking at now. OK. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess a lot of the things I've read of, so because they're now looking at that from my right, how do they, how do they deal with it? And I, I mean, that's a huge question, not just for KIPP, but for all, all sorts of schools working on on getting their kids into college. And I mean, especially challenging for students who's our first generation. Um, but I would also say that, I mean, I think with the charter sector, we, the, this is just a bigger debate about charter schools, right? But that who is the, the question of who is reaching the hardest to educate children. And the children who have kind of the, the, the most needs from everything about what they're experiencing in their home life or their health and where they're living. And are those children, while charters are serving a very needy population in many places, there's, I think if you look at a lot of public schools right now, Right, there's a lot of kids in some of those schools that have no other choice and they're ending up in this public school and they have the highest rates of special education needs. And the, it, I, I think serving those kids probably involves serving a lot of other needs that we're not quite measuring. And that's, we, that's my question. Yeah. Like, what are, like, I'm trying to understand what, what you're saying is not being met by uh -huh. these alternatives which um, oh, you're saying you can't measure. Or, well, or you could measure them, but they might be harder to measure. Um, I mean, I was a high school teacher in Baltimore. Um, and 
I mean, I could think of all sorts of things about what was going on with the well-being of my students for whether they, and a lot of them were not going to go from this school at the point they were at, were not, you know, very likely to go to college, but questions about, you know, how, how much were they in school, what, you know, what was their health situation, were they getting connected to a potential career outlet of some kind, you know, were they networked with some adults in the community who would you know, provide them with a path, whatever it might be. I, I mean, I, I, I guess this is more of a dialogue than a, I don't have a really set answer, but um, it's certainly been something that I've encountered in when I was a teacher, and I would say that it's most, it's very present when you think about the highest need students um, and the students who have the farthest to go to get to college. Yeah. So, uh, I'm gonna, I think yeah. it's sort of got it right from the city on a reaction yeah. from, from Los Angeles about the marathon and uh -huh. I think that's, that story is very, I, I mean, and it's part of what I, but it's also that the alliance, from what I've seen, there's, there is, you know, despite tensions that rise up along the way, there's, a, there's often a working relationship with LA Unified there, or there's some, it, and that, and I mean, in part, it's the kinds of, the people who are in the alliance that help make that happen, like Judy Burton, and it's, I, I mean, I, it, that, I think that's, Key that, and it, but it's not happening overnight. <laughs> but it, it is there's there is some cross pollination that can happen. Yeah. Because we started, as I said, you know, the group of people who've been on the board for years. We started trying to reform LA. Yeah. And that's our hope is to show what's possible, not to say 
And I haven't um, because that that last bit of data I've only collected as of this year. There's always this unfortunate lag with collecting the data from the tax returns. It takes a while to come out. Um, but I, I mean, I think there has been. I, I don't. I, I think generally some funders have probably had a lack of patience with Los Angeles, um, that either because of the slower pace. I, I'm not saying everyone, but um, that um, it's it's not maybe had that sort of hot commodity status that New York did for a while, that New Orleans has more recently, that we can do so much so quickly, let's all invest at once and get these really big dollar numbers. It's more, okay, we like some of our partners in LA, we like the Alliance, we, and, and they, they continue those investments, but it's, I mean, I think it's sort of an undersold, I mean, my, what I would say to funders is you're overlooking <laughs> what the potential that is here. And I think, but I think it takes a different frame of mind to think about how you work in LA, that you don't work in that same really aligned way that they did in New York City. Um, and maybe, maybe there could be some learning on that. I sort of have a two yeah. question. In your research, um, so my, the question would be, in your research when you've been looking at school districts, mm -hmm. because we have the common core changing yes. right now, which is arguably sort of a time of creative destruction. Yes. So <laughs> either we're going to be able to embrace it and, and make these changes collectively, or it's, we're all going down together. Um, so that was my one question. Mm -hmm. And then do you see, just out of curiosity in your research, any parallels between what you described in the New York example, which is um, top-down mayoral sort of how you implement this, and mm -hmm. forgive me, but the, the, the collaborative or the convergence model that you showed where you yeah. have few very large funders focusing on a particular <coughs> issue, and if that issue, like the small schools, for mm -hmm. example, if ultimately that is proved to be not as effective mm -hmm. later, longitudinally, because it takes yeah. so long, yeah. how will that play out, sort of the aftermath? Sorry, that's a very large question. question. <laughs> um, so on the first one, on the Common Core, um, I mean, I've looked at it a little. I guess I'm not sure exactly what your question is on. I mean, there's been a lot of funding for the implementation. Be, has there been in any other districts, because such a huge change is happening that's outside, sort of, nobody has any say anymore it's yeah. whether they like it or not, that maybe there will be some significant change a la New York quickly because we have oh. to be nimble. Has there been any other school district that faced this kind of challenge and really did organically change to meet it in the way that you're talking about? So Can something like that? the Common Core where yeah. there, oh boy. Um, or the Common Core. Hmm. Like yeah, I mean, so far, the story with the Common Core appears to be that we should expect low test scores for a little while. Um, I, I'm, I mean, nothing is really coming to mind for me of a of what you're suggesting a sort of quick shock where um, that leads to that kind of, I, I yeah. Um, but it is, I mean, that's a, that's a, I think that's a good way to put it with the Common Core. It, it is um, going to be a, a big shock to a lot of systems. Well, yeah, it should yeah. be. <laughs> um, and it, what, what I would say is a big question also about the Common Core, if you're looking at it in the, in the full context of all these changes happening at the same time. It's happening at the same time as a lot of changes in teacher evaluation. And I, I think that that has been maybe problematic for thinking about implementation. It's probably one of the things that's causing some of the most backlash and challenges because 
they're changing the, you know, there's these changes to what needs to be taught and how it needs to be taught at the same time that teachers are being evaluated in new and more, more rigorous ways. And arguably, you'd want to phase in maybe the common core before you do the other. Um, but it still looks like we're going to be doing both around the same time. So. <laughs> the component to that is all the technology that the rest of it Yeah, yeah, it's so just really good. It's a lot, uh, and it, it does also create a lot of disruption for thinking about how you even measure these things continuously and effectively. Yeah. Um, uh, but on the on the second question on convergence, um, yeah, I mean, I think there is an argument to be made there that New York has that analogy, and that LA, in some ways, has uh, has less of that because. You have this, you, or at least in, in various windows, particularly during the, the brief window of public school choice in its full form, you had this really interesting window where almost anyone could be an innovator. Um, and New York has kind of never, because it was always the school district was directing, the school district was awarding the contracts, it was very much aligned with who was getting the funding. Um, but I don't think that's the full st I mean, it, New York is huge, right? You still have the Harlem Children's and you still have these huge other things going on. But for that really kind of more small scale innovation, um, LA you know, keeps kind of almost turning the corner, I guess, on the potential for that. And, and New York is maybe not been as, and what the, another part of the New York story that I didn't quite get to is there, there's been a kind of death of advocacy organizations there, which is kind of sad. So you had these citywide parent advocacy organizations around the time of mayoral control basically go defunct. Um, and you had the, I mean, I think the closure of the political process also sort of closed out Right? Who are you going to? Who are you going to mobilize to? Who are you going to? And, and it made it so. What is the point in investing in this process when I don't have someone to have you know make a case to? Um, I think there was another. Yeah. This may be out of your domain to project, but if De Blasio wins and he does change the way in which um, you are moving forward from the sprint to maybe running backwards. <laughs> What, what happens to all the funding that goes into New York now? Is, does it look for other ways to make a difference outside? Of That's a great question. I'm sure there are some funders asking that now. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe they could. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they're attracted to <laughs> Yeah. Could be a win for LA. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I. I um, I was just, I talked to someone who was talking about all the money that the, um, the New York Fund for Public Schools that raises money for the public school system. They raised a whole lot of money in this last year of Bloomberg. And then I think they're thinking, what do we do now? <laughs> because it's a whole, I mean, it's just, the, there's a whole network with it. And Bloomberg particularly, I mean, he's unique, right? But he's a philanthropist himself. And he's just part of this you know, fairly corporate network in New York City. Um, and very well connected. So I think there's a lot of questions about that going forward. On the other hand, you know, you expect some funders to want to shore up what they've done and not, not leave it all behind. Um, but I can't get in their heads exactly and totally imagine what they must be thinking. Yeah. Is the general feeling in New York that the change has been successful or obviously? It's just very polarizing. It's extremely polarized. And you'll see, um, and, and I mean, the research is even polarized, right? So it's, uh, there are researchers who will come out and show things about, say, the small schools and the, the portfolio model that emphasize, look at all the, the kids who are ELL and special needs who are, who are basically not getting into these small schools and ending up left in the increasingly overcrowded large schools. But then if you look at the research on the small schools, it's really good. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it's it, and then you see like, I did networks for, for the school districts as well and how people share information. And those information sharing networks are in these little separate circles of you know people who agree with one another and kind of say, yes, the small school strategy has been great. No, it's been terrible. Um, and I think that speaks to kind of the problem there. Yeah. 
I just want to make a plug for yeah. Chris's earlier point. I think it's especially the next several years yeah. uh, in terms of the, where the money's going. Yeah. For election. I mean, obviously, you can see the New York one in LA. Yeah. It's happening now. It's yeah. Happening this last round. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's a key factor. Yeah. And the tortoise, not the hare. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>